see the house every day when I go to work. So it, it's always there every day. I always think about her. I mean, there's not one day that I don't think about her. When convicted felon Peter Garcia was released from prison, his wife Evelyn reluctantly agreed to let him come back home. So she took him back, and, and he started the same thing all over again. And it escalated. And I begged her, I said, Evelyn, please don't take him back. He's going to kill you. He's going to kill you, Evelyn. Don't take him back. Early on this winter morning, police entered the Garcia home in Far Rockaway, New York, to find a grim scene. Evelyn's son and nephew had been shot, but were alive. Evelyn was dead. This defendant, Peter Garcia, is responsible under our law for taking a 380 Lawson and shooting his wife, Evelyn Garcia. The gun that killed Evelyn Garcia was a Lawson 380 gun most frequently traced by the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Police had hoped that crime scene evidence would prove that Peter Garcia pulled the trigger, but some Lorsons are manufactured with a special coating that rarely leaves fingerprints. Without prints, the best police could hope for was to uncover half an answer. After the gun was test fired, I conducted a microscopic exa examination on the um, recovered bullets and the recovered casings, cartridge casings, to determine if they were fired from that gun or not fired from that gun. Ballistics tests conclusively showed that the gun found at the scene was indeed the murder weapon. But tracing the pistol's serial number was essential to prove that Peter Garcia owned the gun. For that, local police would turn to the ATF. But when ATF tried to trace the Garcia gun, Lorson said there was no record of the gun's serial number, that the gun had never been made. When you run a, a trace on a firearm, it's going to tell a story. It, the, the story is going to be that this gun originated or was born in this location. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, what was different is, is that that did not occur. How does a gun that was never made kill an innocent woman? The answer leads to a world of corporate neglect and criminal greed, to a black market in guns and those who are trained to stop it, and ultimately, to one of the largest gun thefts in United States history. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is Frontline. Additional funding for this program was provided by the California Wellness Foundation, the Center on Crime, Communities, and Culture of the Open Society Institute, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Columbia Foundation, and the Wallace Alexander Gerbodi Foundation. The mystery of the Garcia gun would not be solved in New York City, but 3,000 miles away in an area east of Los Angeles, known as the Inland Empire. It was here that agents from the ATF had been mounting undercover operations to stem the tide of illegal guns. I'm out to buy guns and explosive devices um, that are operable, um, that are functioning, that are loaded. I don't know any other facet of work where the slightest mistake you know, could be your last. 
Daryl McCrary was an Air Force special agent during the Gulf War. For the last five years, he's worked undercover for ATF. I've been in more danger during my undercover assignments in the United States uh, than I've ever been in or ever felt uh, associated with my time in the military. I mean, I've seen pretty much everything. Uh, from machine guns to two-shot derringers to high-capacity 16-plus round uh, handguns, 30-round drum-fed guns, street sweepers, Mac 10s uh, that are often seen in, in the movies. It is just a hodgepodge of different guns, accessories, tools of the trade, if you will. Small caliber, 25 caliber, semi-automatic pistol. The caliber on this is a 9mm, uh, demilitarized version, basically an M16. Modified shotguns, those are the ones that have been, the barrel has been sawed off at one end. This is a, referred to as a Spaz 12. This is an assault shotgun. What would someone do with this? Uh, nothing more than cause a, uh, a lot of damage and, you know, <laughs> wreak a lot of havoc. Uh, with a farm like this, um, imagine. This is basically a grenade tool. You know, that's what this is. No more than that. Every gun in this room was recovered by ATF as part of a criminal investigation. But few can ever be traced back to a criminal. So it was no surprise when the ATF failed to trace the Lorsen 380 that killed Evelyn Garcia. The search for the Garcia gun might have died there. But a few months earlier, McCrary had received an eyebrow-raising tip from a confidential informant. The usually reliable CI believed that he could get two Lorsen 25 caliber handguns, new in the box, and completely clean. Street language for a gun that cannot be traced back to the buyer. The guns came to us in the box. One of the things that, that stood out was the barcode. There was actually a barcode on the box. Not only were the guns brand new, their serial numbers ran sequentially, starting with the number one, meaning that some of these guns were the first ones ever manufactured by Lorson. McCrary was suspicious. But that we were buying that first case, um, you know, bells and whistles were going off. Special Agent Daryl McCrary of the Euro Vapo Tobacco and Fire under Side Field Office. I'll be attempting to make a purchase of one case, which is approximately 36 Lorsen 25 caliber handguns from our primary subject, Jeremy Mendoza. Investigation number 93195950005S as in Sierra. McCrary arranged to meet the gun supplier, 22 year old Jeremy Mendoza by posing, in his words, as just some knucklehead wanting to buy guns. You got, you got them black mountains or they're just the chrome? Just chrome. I keep it simple. Um, it's not television. It's not Dirty Harry. It's Daryl McCurry's life uh, in the balance based on what decisions I make and how I present myself to people. Nice gauge, man. Huh? That new? Yeah. How much you get for that? Mendoza's asking price was $40 a gun, an unusually low street price for a completely clean weapon. It's a very dangerous environment, and it's an ever-changing environment, and you've got to be very quick on your feet, and you've got to have the ability to adapt very quickly to changing situations. The first time I was introduced to him, I was wearing a wire, and that is to say that uh, I was wearing a device, and uh, my confidential informant, without even giving me any type of forewarning or whatever, he just reaches up and he slaps Mendoza upside the head. Bam! And I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? It's like everything changes within a split second, and I'm going, oh, it's it's... It's, it's all going to, to hell now, in the handbasket. Uh, immediately, you know, I'm, I assume a defensive posture because I don't know what's going on. And immediately, the CI goes, 
Hey man, you got a wasp on you. You got a wasp on you. He's he starts beating Mendoza and beating Mendoza starts beating himself and he's jumping around. And at that time, the guy's looking at me and he's going, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm thinking, what, what, what? My fly's open. I, I look down and my wire's dangling on my legs. I'm like, reach down, grab it, and stuff it in my pocket. And just as I do that, Mendoza straightens up and he turns around and he looks at me. And it's like for a moment there, he knows something's not right, but he doesn't know what it is. And I just start talking again. Okay, you said you were going to do it. You all right? You said you are going to do what? And it was just the luck of the draw that that particular day um, wasn't my day to be called up, I guess. Mendoza offered to meet again and guaranteed a steady supply of guns. What shocked McCrary was the sheer numbers for sale. When you're out uh, in an undercover capacity or you work on the informant, he brings back one gun, it's no big deal. When he brings back two or three guns, that no, that's no big deal. Um, when they pull up, you know, and it's kind of like shopping on the home shopping network, and they open up their trunk, and there are cases of guns in the trunk, you, you can barely hide your surprise. I mean, I'm literally having to think to myself, don't don't give yourself away, don't give yourself away, just just relax, you know, take a deep breath, look off, uh, because I'm thinking, there's no way that this guy has all these guns, there's, there's no way, how can you have all these guns, nobody would have, a, I don't see this many guns if I go to the gun shop, you know, and to know that they must have come from somewhere, and they're, they're brand new, and they're in the box, and they're packaged, um, you're thinking, you know, you know, where the hell did this come from? What Daryl McCrary was seeing was the tip of the iceberg. For the previous 10 years, the inexpensive pistol market had skyrocketed, and with it, the number of illegal guns on the streets. In California, for every 10,000 cheap handguns sold each year, roughly 2,200 have shown up in crimes. It is an explosion that has caught even veteran law enforcement officers by surprise. 80, 50. We're talking a lot of guns. We average probably eight to ten guns being brought in here daily. I mean, it, it's overwhelming, the amount of guns. When I first started here, we averaged maybe one gun a week. Scotty Zolko works in the evidence vault of the San Bernardino Police Department. It's his job to keep track of weapons recovered from crime scenes, a task getting harder to keep up with every year. The boxes on the shelves are all handguns and there's an average of about 40 guns in each box. When I came here in 1975, we had a gun room that was probably smaller than this aisle right here. And we, only prob we probably only had a 100, 150 guns total, long guns and handguns. There's a lot of guns in here. There's probably in excess of 10,000 guns in here. Police departments across Southern California recover and dispose of nearly 40,000 guns every year. While all makes and models of guns have flooded the illicit market, the weapon of choice for gun traffickers is the inexpensive, easily concealed pistol. The dramatic increase in the number of cheap handguns manufactured in the 1980s and early 90s Parallel the tripling in youth gun deaths. How many times did he shoot at you? Just once. Was he close to you or far away? Do you know if it was a revolver or an automatic? I'm an ER doc. I practice emergency medicine, uh, and I used to do it full-time. It's not enough just to treat trauma. We need to prevent it. And then if we want to expand our ability to save people from dying from a gunshot wound, we need to keep them from getting shot in the first place. Dr. Garen Wintemute has been working for new regulation of the firearms industry for the past 10 years. His main target is the cheap handgun. The idea here is to refocus upstream, but it's foolish to ignore, as we have for so long with regard to firearm violence, where it starts, and that's with the manufacturer of firearms. 
And now I can also fight again. Maybe we can fight again. So if I put the ring in the right place, I can trip the switch. Yeah, and that's what you can change. I'm actually something of a, of a moderate uh, in the spectrum of, of gun policy. I don't own any guns at the moment, but I have in the past. Um, I've, I've taught shooting for a living. Um, I grew up with guns to some extent, and I think they have a legitimate role to play in society. I think the role they do play has gotten entirely out of control. The basic consumer protection framework that people have come to know and rely upon for everything from motor vehicles to teddy bears simply does not exist. And it does not exist as a result of conscious and deliberate action taken by Congress in the 1960s. The very existence of the inexpensive homegrown handgun market can be traced to the assassination of Robert Kennedy in 1968. Eager to do something to stop the flow of cheap, small-caliber guns, like the one that killed Kennedy, the federal government demanded new, strict controls on imported handguns. What in the name of conscience will it take to pass a truly effective gun control law? But the 1968 Gun Control Act would have unintended consequences. Its restriction on foreign guns created an entirely new, protected American industry, which now produces all of the country's cheap, low-caliber handguns. Six companies in Southern California dominate the business all located within a one-hour drive of the hotel where Kennedy was shot. Together, the companies manufacture over a quarter of a million guns each year for a combined annual sales of nearly $15 million. Brico Arms, Lorson, Davis, Phoenix, and Sundance. Three years ago, Dr. Garen Wintemute published a report on these companies damning the production methods and marketing practices of the group he calls the Ring of Fire. It's borrowed from the term describing the volcanoes that sit around the rim of, of the Pacific Ocean. And there was an effort to link, by, by adopting that term, to link the sense of hazard associated with those volcanoes to these firearms manufacturers. We specifically looked at a known number of guns made by each company in a defined period of time so that we could look at the risk per gun, if you will, of being involved in crime regardless of the number of guns any particular company made. And it was on that basis that we found that guns from the Ring of Fire companies were more than three times as likely to show up in ATF's tracing data as were guns from other major manufacturers. Something is different about the way these guns are functioning in the criminal community. He's had quite a devastating effect. Um, he has promoted the idea that, um, that our guns are unsafe. And he's done this in a reckless and careless manner. And he's gotten a number of people to believe it. Bruce Jennings is the patriarch of the Southern California gun industry. A brand new P-51 Mustang, built two years ago by hand. It's got a Rolls-Royce engine in it at uh, 1,640 horsepower, 450 mile an hour airplane. We're just ordinary people in ordinary lives. Um, you know, we're not out here uh, creating problems. We're just minding our own business and, uh, you know, concentrating on manufacturing and sales of firearms. It's a legitimate business, it's an interesting business, and we enjoy it. Bruce Jennings is the president of BL Jennings, one of the largest distributors of small caliber pistols in the country, a company he started as a spin-off from his father George's firearms business. 
My father tried everything in business. He tried the fishing pole holders. He tried hairspray devices. He tried uh, tooling. He tried medical devices, snake bite kits. My father's arms were just covered with scars from where he was testing a snake bite cutter kit. Um, he was quite an inventor and a very interesting man, but most of his ideas were a little bit on the odd side. Here is uh, when my father was doing fishing pole holders, a uh, little you know, plastic PVC and a metal stick for a fishing pole holder. But what he did, he doodled on paper continuously. And this is one of the guns that he develops. You can see the shape of the gun. You can see little mechanisms and little sketches. And, uh, this design would later become the Raven 25 caliber pistol, one of the most successful guns ever manufactured. George Jennings would sell three million of them over the next 25 years. George Jennings' son, Bruce, learns the trade from Dad, uh, splits off in 1978 to found his own company, Jennings Firearms. Bruce's sister, Gail, splits off uh, with her husband, Jim Davis, who's George Jennings' plant manager, uh, to found Davis Industries in 1982. And then onto the market also comes a high school buddy of Bruce Jennings by the name of Jim Waldorf, who decides there's room here for me too. His plant manager is the disaffected brother, John, of Jim Davis, husband to Gail Jennings, daughter to George Jennings, not to leave out George's nephew, Steve, uh, who also founds a company that uh, never got very big and has since gone out of production. It's one family. Hey, look here, man. These motherfuckers ain't gonna come back to me, right? Uh -huh. I mean, this shit ain't gonna come back to me if something happens, drops, something like that, right? I don't know you, you don't know me. Right. McCreary's investigation was into its second month when Mendoza revealed something new. Instead of the cheap 25 calibers he had been selling, Mendoza unwrapped two cases of powerful Lorsen 9mm pistols, the increasingly popular gun on the street. At the crucial moment, as the cover team was taping the buy, McCreary got another surprise. So I'm standing here, and right in the middle of that, a big tractor trailer, 18 wheeler, pulls up into the parking lot. He cuts right in the middle of our deal. I mean, so while we're doing this deal, it's like pretty much for anybody else out there, I don't exist anymore. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to have to, well, hold up, man. I need to, you know, this man in his truck, he's kind of peeking us out. You know, I want to make sure that if we're doing this deal, nobody really knows what we're doing, you know. So, so he, he accommodates me and he says, okay, no problem. You know, we start talking about his car and, you know, girls and stuff like that. And I'm waiting. I'm thinking this is the truck from hell. This guy goes forward. Then he backs up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, fucker, let me get this dude out of this truck. We're talking about 415, right? Cool. What's up, let's do it here, man. Can't believe this, man. What's up with this, man? Cold as <laughs> He got this dude fucking around in his truck. And I'm thinking, well, what is this? This is any time but now. You know, we'd have never been able. I, I couldn't have found a truck if I needed one. But now this big truck's here. And I'm, what I'm trying to do is slow this deal down so that we capture this for later, you know, prosecutorial uh, reference, we're able to, to say this is what happened on this particular date and associated with some tape, some footage. Oh, man. See, that way you can just hit me up. I ain't got it, because last night, man, I was trying to get up. I'm coming from L.A. So the traffic's bad. I get up here, man, homeboy told me, he talked to me yesterday. He said, oh, yeah, homeboy got him, you know, come on up. Right. Finally, the truck pulls off, and I'm like, okay, this guy's gone. I'm looking around, everything's okay. We do the deal, we count some money out, everything's square, boom, we're off to the races. But it was like, you know, just like I said, Murphy's going to rear his ugly head. And it seemed like every time we would get together, it would be one more thing that would happen. You know, first it's the B thing, now it's the truck. The very next day, Agent McCrary learned that his biggest worry had come true, that he was not Mendoza's only client. An ex-con known as Andre Mitchell was also selling the same models of Lorsen guns to another ATF undercover agent. Yeah, what was special about this situation was, yeah, the guns were cheap and the amount we were haggling over, well, how many do I get for 10? How many do I get for 15? What about later and getting some cases or something down the road? So it just seems like this guy had a, uh, you know, endless supply. You know, and he was confident that he can get more. He asked, uh, hey, man, where are you getting these guns? And Mitchell... Uh, replied, 
uh, I know a guy, he's getting it from the factory. And this was a very crucial piece of information because now we knew the source of the guns. We knew the gun type. Now we knew the source of the guns, which would lead us in a different direction. Alarmed at the spreading gun sales, McCrary decided to put out a trace on the pistols he was buying from Mendoza through both the ATF and California systems. He got the same puzzling results as the New York police when they tried to trace the Garcia gun. According to Lorson, the guns with those serial numbers had never been produced. There was nothing on the gun. It was as if this gun was never sold, never existed. So, essentially, you have a gun that, that has no history. McCrary then learned that Mendoza actually worked at Lorson. Every sign pointed to an inside job. To find out how deep the Lorson gun ring went, McCrary decided to broaden his search to include criminal records involving any Lorson gun. Crime by crime, he patiently developed a system for tracing the guns. It's only after I get this list that I realize, you know, the magnitude of this problem. Um, these are coming directly from the factory. These are hot off the presses, if you will. Um, we have to realize that this guy is a hot commodity. He does, in fact, work for Lewis Engineering. It's getting that special prize in the Cracker Jack box, and that's what we got. Lorson Engineering is the country's fifth largest handgun manufacturer. Its president, Jim Waldorf, prides himself on making the world's most affordable handguns. Is this one of your better sellers? It's a good seller, but our best seller is actually 380. 380 is the number one selling handgun in the United States. It's a seven shot capacity. Uh, we've sold quite a few of them, I think, as far as 380 production goes in the United States. Uh, we were probably 40% of the 380 sales in 1993. 40%? 40%. 40%. That's an incredible figure. It is incredible figure. Well, we truly are the world's most affordable handguns, and we consider ourselves actually the blue-collar gun of America. So you've done good numbers with this as well. It's been a very popular seller. It's been a very popular <clears throat> seller. Essentially, affordable firearms or a gun that does not have a retail price tag of perhaps $600 is a Chevrolet. It's not a Mercedes. Functions extremely well. Quality is extremely good. But we build Chevrolets, and the average American drives a Chevrolet. They don't drive a Mercedes. Re retails in the area of about $149. That's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Pay an average of 600 for a firearm that I carry. Oh, yeah. We're giving them affordable self-protection. There's two million people a year that defend themselves with, with a handgun, and you don't hear that on the 6 o'clock news. And we're giving them affordable self-protection, some, something that a blue-collar blue worker can afford to keep in his dresser or drawer at home to protect his family. It's cheap, for sure. The prices are low, and if that's what they mean by affordable, I agree. Um, I, I very much disagree with their contention that these guns, on balance, are protection. Uh, like the other companies, uh, Lorson promotes its guns primarily as a means of self-protection. But there's actually a great deal of evidence. In fact, there's a, a periodical called Gun Tests, which I think arguably might be considered consumer reports for the gun community. doesn't accept advertising, calls it like they see it. They class these guns generally as potentially worse than useless for defensive purposes. Gun Test Magazine, mm -hmm. um, which, speaking of your 22, said we wouldn't pay any amount of money for a gun that self-destructs in a couple hundred rounds. Stay away from this one. Well, number one, I think you have to realize that Gun Test Magazine is an extremely, extremely critical magazine. And I think that, number two, you want to take a look at what issue of Gun, gun Tests that was, and it's probably a very old issue. May 96. May 96. Uh, I haven't seen that issue. I haven't seen that issue. Gun Tests magazine, like Garen Wintemute, has been critical of almost all the Ring of Fire guns. And it's jammed again. I'm not going to be able to clear this one. Can I get some professional help here? 
I point my gun at the bad guy, I pull the trigger and the gun locks up, as they often do, as they have in my hands. I'm not speaking hypothetically here. Suddenly, I'm facing an armed intruder with a gun in my hand pointed at him that is useless to me. I'm in deep trouble. Garen Wintermute's research has inspired 31 communities in California to pass laws banning the sale of low-quality guns, threatening the profits of companies like Lorsen. America was built with firearms, and it's certainly a person's civil right to own a firearm. And I think that when you start looking at prohibiting ownership of a firearm based on the price of the firearm, you've just taken a very large segment of society and told them that they, they don't belong to an elitist class, and therefore they have no right to defend their family. So you think that those laws would be discriminatory? Absolutely discriminatory. I feel they'd be more discriminatory than slavery. More discriminatory than slavery? Absolutely. Also comes with a detachable wrist strap or shoulder straps for the ladies. You don't want to lock the, the ladies out of it. Carry that also on your shoulders. Manufacturers like Lorsen achieve their success by keeping sales volume high. They do so by constantly developing new technologies, new materials, and new markets. This pink grip comes in 22 caliber as well as the 25 caliber. The 22 caliber. Women are probably 25% of our sales, but it's growing. But there is a huge consciousness of personal safety in the women's market. A dealer survey suggested that it wasn't actually women that were buying them, it was men that were buying them for their wives and their girlfriends. Okay, there, and, there was an assumption that they like pink. The assumption they like the feminist okay. type of thing. And as Carlotta pointed out, she prefer, prefer yeah. a black guy. I prefer a black, yeah. As I think most people. They have a famous ad with three of their pistols, one with a pearl-handled grip, one with a pink grip. Uh, and the, the caption on the ad is, three little ladies that get the job done. The handgun industry exhibits all the behaviors of a consumer product industry. Well, the feel of a gun in itself is, is kind of a powerful feel. You get to pick something up that, uh, that makes you more equal than the person standing next to you. And a lot of people cry for that. Most people love to pick up a gun and feel it. They like the way that it feels in their hand. It transfers a kind of a spiritual feel into their body by holding such a such a powerful piece. But uh, the gun is a very sensual item. It's a very powerful, sensual piece of equipment. This little pistol has a laser device located in the frame. And the frame of the gun is made out of out of polymer, which is plastic. And this is the new standard. This is where in 1997 the firearms industry is headed. The laser, I'll demonstrate it here, is this red dot. The red dot is where the bullet will impact. It's, it's a very fun feature for a gun, and especially when you're doing target shooting. It's, it's very, very fun. The laser will tell you where that bullet's going to go, but it doesn't tell you what's there. It doesn't tell you that that, that that moving target at the other end of the darkened room is a bad guy and not a member of your family who's gotten up to go to the bathroom. The most recent studies show firearms kill nearly 40,000 Americans a year, injure over twice as many, and are involved in nearly a million crimes. But Americans have mixed feelings about their guns. Two-thirds believe guns contribute to violence. The same number believe they need them for protection. When you have them, man, just set a, set a case aside, man. I can get out. You know what I'm saying? You set a case aside, I get out. You know what I'm saying? They'll go. All right, man. It's all good. I'll get with you. The Mendoza case was entering a crucial stage. Four-door Chevy, California license plate O. U R Oscar uniform Romeo 701 Chevrolet Impala light cream color right back of him. McCrary found himself caught in the classic undercover agent's dilemma. 
He knew the source of the guns, but he didn't know who else might be involved. The longer he spent investigating, the more guns would hit the streets. And Mendoza was putting a lot of guns on the street. We had made deals to buy as many as four or five cases of these, of these guns at one time. It was just that this particular person was selling them, being Mendoza, selling them faster than we could keep up with him, try as we might. I mean, he was selling them too fast. And, and you know, obviously our anxiety level was going to go up because of that. We did not want to miss one gun. If we had the opportunity to buy it, that was an opportunity that that gun wasn't going to go out on the street and be used in crime. Um, 18 cases, um, 25 calibers, that's 36 guns to a case, or 9 millimeter, that's 30 guns to a case, and he's old 18 cases. You know, you're thinking, you know, this guy's serious. That This is for real. There's no doubt about it. This guy's a player, and we've got to take him down as, as quickly as possible. Jeremy Mendoza had no criminal record. He had been employed at Lorson for almost two years and was considered a quiet but good employee who worked in the powder coating section that bakes the rough black finish onto the guns, the finish that hampered the police in Far Rockaway from getting fingerprints off the Garcia gun. When McCrary learned that a shipment of Mendoza's guns had reached all the way to Sacramento, he decided it was time to go to the Lorson plant and bring him in. An average industrial complex, much like you'd find in any other part of Southern California. I know I was quite surprised the first time I came down here to find that a gun manufacturer would be in a building such as this. The morning that uh, we arrested Mendoza, we walk in and what we see is just boxes and boxes of guns. And we don't see anybody. We don't see any workers, we don't see any security, we don't see anybody. And we kind of look at each other as if to say, well, you know, you know, what's going on? Suddenly, we do see a worker and he doesn't seem particularly interested in us. Um, we make contact with him and we, he walks back and he gets Mendoza who comes up. And I just walked up to him and I pulled out my badge. And I said, you know what time this is? And he said, yeah. And uh, it was simply that. I mean, there was a brief look of surprise, and then there was a resignation of, you got me. When McCrary entered the Lorson factory, what he saw had shocked him. Here at one of the biggest gun manufacturers in the country, he says he was within arm's reach of guns in all states of assembly, with nobody there to stop him. I've dealt with security on a pretty high level. And uh, anybody with a security background with knowledge of this would probably say, what security? Michael Bryant had worked at Lorson as a production line supervisor, overseeing 30 workers, including Jeremy Mendoza. Well, there, there was no security. There was absolutely no security at all. They had no security officers, no uh, metal detectors, or not anything like that. So people would walk in after, during lunchtime and walk in the shipping and receiving department and just look at the guns. Just play with them a little bit and look at them and see how they looked. Put them back inside the, in the box and go back up, uh, go about their business. Did they ever take them out of the box and keep them? Oh, yes. <laughs> there were guns missing. Now the shipping and receiving department. If, if you were slick about it and watchful, you could take whatever you wanted. Uh, guns were stored in locked rooms, and the locks weren't sufficient enough to keep the two employees out of the rooms. Did you have security guards? No, we didn't. Not at the time. Did you have any kind of fencing or locked? Uh, they were locked, closed rooms. And I think that if you take a thief that's intent on stealing something, if they want something bad enough, they're going to steal it. A gun manufacturer has to have a certain level of controls because this is a controlled item. Every gun that is serialized is a controlled item. And to be able to just walk in to a building and not be questioned for a gun manufacturer is out of the question. I, it just would be unfathomable. I mean, it would be like being able to walk into a major department store with nobody there and all the goodies there for the taking.
Let me give you as a contrast Smith & Wesson. Go to Smith & Wesson. Hundreds and hundreds of yards away from the manufacturing facility, you encounter a gate. You do not get through that gate without clearance of the very burly, very well-informed and electronically connected um, security guard who's in a blockhouse. Um, and if you did get in, you'd have a hard time getting into the plant. Most of Smith & Wesson's plant is underground for security reasons. It was built at a time when they were worried about its destruction as, as, as a, um, an act of war. But Smith & Wesson is like a fortress. Lorson is like a park. Here you're producing firearms, and you have them being stolen by the thousands. And you, there's not even a, a oh. fence. There's not even a security guard. Now listen, that's 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 a, a pretty sensational aspect. It's a very sensitive aspect to me because I don't like the idea of, of thinking that people stole a couple thousand handguns from us either. I told Jim exactly what was going on. I told Jim that there was uh, drugs being sold in this plant. I told him that there were guns coming up coming up missing, and that there was racism in the plant. And then Jim said, "Okay, I'm going to investigate, and I'll call you back." Bryant says that so many guns went missing from the factory floor that he was afraid he might at some point be blamed for the losses. He devised an inventory system of his own to keep track of the gun parts coming and going from his department. So I developed a uh, system and uh, kept accurate account of the 380 frames, the slides, and the 25 slides and frames. And I would write down the time in one box. I would write A and B, and then how many... 102 left at 8:37 a.m. I would be 100 would be complete with the blue because I had it also color coded also, so I would have a, a document to show how many uh, slides and frames that um, went into the department and came out. Soon after starting the inventory system, Bryant was fired from the company. He filed a racial discrimination suit that was settled out of court by Lorson for $3,000. The impact of Lorson's security and accounting problems were showing up in police departments across the country, as when Scotty Zolko tried to trace a Lorson 25 caliber reported stolen in Riverside County. The gun that we pulled out is stolen from a shipment of guns that was sent out of the Lorson factory. According to the records, they had it missing since February of 96, and we've had it here since February of 95. I don't know. <laughs> Cute, isn't it? I don't know what they do over there and how long it takes them to discover something is missing. But uh, if it takes a year, a lot of things could happen with that gun in a year. According to an internal ATF memorandum, the agency has experienced considerable difficulty tracing guns through Lorson for several years. And they say there have been over 100 traces in which Lorson provided incorrect information to ATF. The biggest problem of this kind they have ever had with a gun manufacturer. We have done the best at accounting for every single gun that we manufacture that's humanly possible. You've not heard at all that there was a problem with guns being traced to Lorson and Lorson saying that the gun had not been manufactured. No. Guns that had been used in crimes. No. You've never heard this before? Uh, I've heard an allegation, but I don't think that it's ever been confirmed. So, you really did not know of any accounting problems that uh, well, the heard, company had? I had heard allegations, but I think every, country, every company in the world has, has had accounting problems. And again, I wish we could get into more detail, but you've absolutely worn me down. Well, I'd like to talk about it more. Frontline has learned that ATF is conducting a criminal investigation of Lorson, trying to determine if it broke the law by failing to report missing guns, and whether Lorson misled the ATF during its investigation. But this case has also raised questions about the agency itself and the way it traces guns. My name's Tammy, and I'm with the ATF Tracing Center in West Virginia, and I need some assistance with a gun trace. During the year of the Mendoza investigation,
The unsuccessful traces of Lorsen guns all came through the ATF National Tracing Center. Yet no one saw a pattern and raised a red flag. ATF, I think, ends up damned if they do and damned if they don't. They are attempting to regulate an industry with one hand and several other fingers um, tied behind their back. A simple computer program could have alerted ATF to the unusual pattern of the Lorsen traces, but they didn't have one. And that's not the only inefficiency in the system. Part of the problem is that Congress has forbidden ATF from using computers to track gun sales, not wanting to create a central registry. Instead, the ATF must follow a paper trail and rely on a labor-intensive process that finds the gun's owner in less than half of its cases. Do you need to speak to someone who can give me assistance with the gun trace? It's tremendously inefficient, and it's inefficient by design. Uh, the last time they tried to make a, a serious effort to regulate not just the industry, but even illegal commerce um, in firearms, there was a serious effort made to abolish them altogether. I think the ATF, as a law enforcement agency, um, deserves to have the sort of manpower, the sort of material resources that they need in order to do that job. Well, we're pleased to be able to give the Distinguished Achievement Award to special agents of ATF, DEA. I know I got up in the morning, I had this case on my mind, I would sleep, I would dream about different parts of the case, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and say, oh, I didn't think of that, you know. I would have never imagined in a million years that, um, very new to the job, that I would, you know, stumble upon a case like this, the magnitude, you know, all these guns, you know, I wouldn't have thought about this being in 15 years. Daryl McCrary is now a rising star in ATF, honored by his colleagues for cracking one of the biggest cases in Bureau history. But he's still bothered by the guns that got away. Every gun that gets out is a gun that could be potentially used in a crime. It's a gun that could be potentially used in an act of violence against another person. And as an agent or as a police officer, you have this, this edict that or you're going to go out and you're going to prevent this from happening. Um, this one gun could mean a difference in you know, a person going home at night. After three years, McCrary knows what happened to only a fraction of the Mendoza guns. This particular gun, serial number 367584, it's an L380, um, was recovered in, or a request for the trace was done in 1995 out of uh, New York City. That's the gun that killed Evelyn Garcia. That's the information that I have. This gun was used in a murder in New York City. In addition to the gun that killed Evelyn Garcia, the gun that never existed, the Larson guns have already shown up in over 500 crimes. A homicide in Virginia. A robbery in Louisiana. A carjacking in California. They screamed and they pulled out guns saying, everybody get down. This woman was terrorized along with seven other people in the armed robbery of a restaurant. I was waiting for a gunshot to go off. I just thought, this is it, or somebody's gonna die here. First you're like numb. Karen Hayes was carjacked at gunpoint on her way to make a pizza delivery. But after a while it all starts to sink in and that is, it is terrifying. That's when you really get scared again. I watched for, for days, for weeks. I watched. Make sure nobody follows me home. The ATF now estimates that the Mendoza case alone put 6,000 illegal Lorsen guns onto the streets. You've got to be kidding me. 6,000 guns. That is amazing. Jesus. That is a small army.